Our next speaker is Matthew Siegel, who is Chair of Conservation and Collections Management at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. He's responsible for the administration, supervision, direction, and coordination of all activities uh, and personnel of the museum's eight conservation and collections management departments. He's overseeing the development and implementation of museum-wide uh, policies and protocols. Previously, he served as the first collections manager uh, at the MFA Boston, and before that, he was registrar at the Wad Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, the associate registrar at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and exhibitions manager at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. He's been committed to preservation and stewardship of material culture resources and uh, been a leading fundraiser to help organize conservation profession around the need to develop sustainable and practical uh, policies. In 2010, he organized the Boston Climate Roundtable that brought together the heads of conservation departments uh, at the 30 largest art museums in the United States and Canada and partnered with the American Institute of Conservation to address and revise museum environmental standards. We talked last night about uh, what one does with nine feet of snow atop one's glass cube building. Uh, and that is, in fact, one of the climate-derived things that, um, that we were talking about here. Uh, the reason why he's here, however, is because at the MFA, he's organized a program called Conservation in Action, in which the conservator is brought out of the back of the house and installed in the front uh, with the artwork as, in some sense, a subject uh, of view as well as an actor. So with the conservator as performer, we invite Matthew Siegel to the podium. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I very much enjoyed the presentation through the day and hope I can make a lively contribution myself. Uh, publicly viewable uh, conservation spaces have seemed to uh, unilaterally pop up around the globe in the last decade. Uh, I think uh, there's been a convergence of uh, of reasons for this, and we could uh, dedicate uh, a whole day of symposia to that alone. But I think many such national programs owe their beginnings to uh, the Lunder Conservation Center at uh, the National Museum of American Art, uh, National Portrait Gallery. Uh, the Lunder, which opened in 2006, um, gave the public access to the conservation wing uh, where there was a suite of conservation studios that had a, a glass-fronted cutaway wall and allowed the public uh, to view what was going on inside. The, um, the impetus for the idea was very sound, but uh, uh, the uh, concept was not that well developed yet. Uh, at least in the beginning, um, the conservators didn't didn't alter their practice at all and actually even tended to hide uh, from the public in the corners of these spaces. <laughs> um, if we skip ahead 10 years, I think the uh, publicly viewable conservation space uh, has been fully embraced uh, by our discipline and by our profession, uh, reaching a somewhat predictable climax in the realm of media circus, which we'll get to uh, at the end of the talk. Um, uh, information about the preparation, creation, and conservation of artwork is necessary uh, to complete the story, the history of art, and for informing individual works. Explaining and sharing background on the materials and techniques, as well as insight into the history and decision-making of art conservation is essential to the general discourse and needs to be provided to the viewing public. It can also open up a new level or means of access to audiences they may not otherwise be able to relate to the fine arts by demonstrating that often the people that were responsible for producing the work 
We're not artists per se, but we're craftsmen, or tradespeople, if you will, in that the work is not static through time, not something that, stares, that only stares down at one from up high on a wall only to be interpreted, contextualized, and venerated, but as a living entity that changes over time and was and could be and needs to be acted upon. It's imperative to raise the awareness of the role and importance of preservation of cultural heritage in general and as an aspect of the museum's mission, including the expertise, time, and resources that are necessary to commit. I've been completely stymied by curators and designers unwilling to give over space in the galleries and exhibitions to technical information. Conservatives' contributions to museum exhibitions were and still largely are relegated to back of book catalog essays. And at the MFA, the administration has been diametrically opposed to exposing behind the scenes aspect of the museum, um, treating and seeing the, the galleries and the whole museum as uh, theater sets really and that no one should ever see the backside of. Incorporating the act of conservation and the physical conservation space into the galleries is a primary and necessary step in the understanding of art. The integration of the sciences and the humanities and the evolution of the museum as a promoter of critical thought. All right, I meant to get to these. These are just some uh, old prints of sculpture making and uh, sculpture conservation over time. And the artist of craftsman or tradesperson. Uh, our first real public conservation project um, was on the Antioch Mosaic. Uh, this is Roman Eastern Mediterranean from third century. There are three, three large panels from uh, a place called the, uh, the House of the Drinking Contest. Uh, the central panel, uh, sorry, these were um, excavated by Dumbarton Oaks uh, on a combined uh, excavation with Princeton and Worcester. Uh, uh, mosaics um, from the same site at those museums as well. We acquired this from Dumbarton Oaks in 2002. Uh, it had been excavated in the 1930s and had been uh, stored outside in a shed on their grounds since then. Um, the central panel, 10 by 10, the two side panels are 10 by 6. They were backed with 6 inches of concrete. Um, that made the central panel weigh about four tons. Um, the first part of the conservation project was uh, carried out at an off-site uh, facility due to the scale, the size, the space that was necessary, and also how dirty the process of cutting the concrete back off was. Um, the, the face, the tesserae were faced uh, with holytex, which is this uh, spun polyester cloth uh, to keep them in place while the panels were flipped over and the concrete was cut and chiseled off the back. Uh, lightweight, extremely rigid hexol aluminum panels were epoxied uh, to the backs to serve uh, as their structure after the concrete was removed. And the panels were transported back to the museum. The second stage of conservation began at the MFA in February 2005 and had to take place in the gallery where the mosaic was to be eventually exhibited because the panels were to be joined together and uh, connected with a, a cast uh, plaster border, uh, the, the complete object uh, being 10 by 22 feet long and uh, both for reasons of, of its size and the composition and we weren't, we weren't gonna be able to move it once we put it together. This was an adapted gallery space uh, with little upgrades for conservation. You can see the 
objects that came off you in the background there. The space had no climate control, uh, but we needed to add, uh, to wall it off from the public uh, and to add uh, solvent fume exhaust uh, due to the fact that we needed to use acetone to remove the facing that we had adhered to the surface. We provided graphics uh, both about the history of the object and about the, um, the ongoing treatment. And we added uh, a video uh, in the viewing space about the first half of the treatment um, so that everyone could understand how we got to the point that we were at. We were all surprised um, by how popular uh, the treatment, the public treatment proved to be, and the response that we got from everyone. Having a large dedicated space, uh, dedicated just to this project, allowed us to entertain patrons, um, docents, uh, and school groups alike. And the space was very close to the ancient curatorial offices, uh, which promoted uh, ongoing discussions uh, between the curator, Christine Condolian, on the left, and the lead conservator, Mayon Su, on the right. Uh, but when the project was completed, uh, the gallery was open to the public, and we packed up and left. Our second project began in 2007 was on Thomas Sully's uh, Passage of the Delaware. This was an NEH uh, Save America's Treasures grant, uh, facilitated by the Save America's Treasures grant. Uh, the painting, which is ridiculously large, was painted by Sully for the North Carolina State House, but was never installed there because they couldn't get it in. <laughs> uh, and it was too large for the room that it had been commissioned for. So it was purchased by a private individual in Boston and eventually made its way to the MFA. Um, it depicts uh, Christmas night in 1776 in uh, Washington and as troops crossed the Delaware River and surprised the British at Trenton and it was the battle that uh, we say turned the tide of the war. There was no place in the museum the project could be done because of the scale it certainly couldn't fit in the paintings conservation studio. And as a result, the grant proposal to NEH was written uh, with us renting a large warehouse space. Just some images to give you some idea of the scale of the painting. Uh, we were to remove old varnish and overpainting, uh, repair small tears, new in paint, re-varnish, strip and refinish the frame, and uh, recast the missing corner ornament to the frame. The museum was undergoing renovations, and the grant was awarded to prepare the painting for a new wing dedicated to the art of the Americas. The front entrance of the museum was also being renovated, and the adjacent gallery of Nubian art was due to be closed and become a new ticketing area. Unbelievably, I convinced both the administration and the ancient department to close the Nubian Gallery a year ahead of schedule to allow us to do the year-long project there. It would be seen by everybody who entered the museum, and the NEH was thrilled when we told them. This is the front entrance of the museum. It was, again, an adapted space um, with very little upgrades, no, no climate control in there. We didn't add exhaust there either. We used portable uh, HEPA units for the uh, fume extraction. We had glass on two sides, the front and the side, and we added our graphics. Uh, but the most important part was that the program was christened with a name, Conservation in Action. It was wildly popular, again, and it was recognized as a great teaser, a way to generate excitement about upcoming programming. But again, when we finished, we had to pack up and leave the space. This is the only before and after treatment photo I'm going to show you. Um, 
certainly looks a lot more cold and icy in the, uh, in the upper left. The third project was uh, to treat uh, another uh, monumental canvas uh, by Garrett van Hanhorst, a Dutch 17th century painter, um, uh, The Triumph of the Winter Queen. Uh, this was painted for Elizabeth Stewart, the Winter Queen, and it depicts uh, her. I don't know if it's too dark to see. And I also, this doesn't seem to work. Can you guys see that? Um, she's trampling uh, Neptune, and you can tell by his trident here, uh, with her chariot wheel in revenge for uh, the death of her eldest son. Uh, again, due to its scale, the treatment of this painting was not possible to do in the painting's conservation studio and was another great candidate for a public conservation project. Uh, fresh after our success with the Sully and again due to ongoing renovations, I again convinced the ancient department to close a gallery uh, to allow us to do the project. It was a small inconvenience that this space was located on the second floor of the museum. And here we are carrying the painting up the grand staircase at the entrance. Uh, we had $40,000 to upgrade the space. Uh, that was certainly far more money than we had been able to throw at the prior two spaces. The space already had climate control, uh, so it allowed us to do a number of other things. Uh, we added the plexi front. Uh, we added fume exhaust. It was a built-in easel. We purchased the genie lift just for this project. We added the graphics out front describing the treatment. And the space again carried our name, Conservation in Action. Uh, in this project, we added the whiteboard. Um, conservators wrote uh, daily updates for the public to read uh, about the ongoing activity. And there it's on a cute little miniature easel, of course, because it's a paintings project. Um, also with this project, uh, the program received a graphic identity, um, the title wall, uh, the graphics, um, both on the plexi wall and the didactic text, uh, as well as the web page, all had a consistent graphic treatment. And so now the program had a name and had a graphic ID. We'd uh, adopt that, that graphic uh, ID going forward permanently. We still carry it today. Uh, similar in scale to the Sully, uh, the treatment was similar, but more extensive as the painting's a couple of hundred years older. And also at some point in its past, it had been uh, folded up like a drop cloth. And as a result, uh, there was a checkerboard of uh, losses uh, where the creases had been. Um, at this point, social media started playing a role. Uh, our project received more Facebook likes than any other programming in the museum. It was really uh, undeniable, and this precipitated the decision that the program, Conservation in Action, would be able to permanently remain in this space and have a permanent home. Uh, given that we had a permanent home, we started including the promise of performing treatments in public view t in our grant proposals, in our funding proposals, uh, which uh, again proved very popular uh, with our funders. We tried to rotate different conservation studios, uh, showing different types of material. Through the room, we tried to sync up uh, the projects and the work we were working on with the programming, uh, with works that were needed for exhibitions. And uh, thought, laid out the projects, uh, sort of des designed them and laid them out for being viewed by the public and uh, you know, also thought of projects that we could do that would be visually engaging, it tended to be large scale, but um, we're working on that. Uh, just a few shots, give you some idea again of the scale of the work. Uh, it had a special little exhibition of its own uh, after we finished treatment. Um, then we had to again unstretch it, uh, roll it. Uh, this is uh, in the Dutch gallery in front of uh, two full-length Rembrandt portraits, 
just prior to stretching, restretching, install in the, a ref, the refurbished Dutch gallery, and here it is in its final install. Our next project was a Leon Levy uh, Foundation funded uh, project to stabilize these two uh, Etruscan sarcophagus, uh, stabilize them, clean them, and mount them. Um, they're very well inscribed. We know who they belong to, the Tetanese family, and that they were excavated in the 1840s in Volci in central Italy. They were brought to Boston in the 1880s and they actually opened the museum in 1886. This is where they were initially installed. Uh, because of their combined uh, size and fragility, they weigh uh, not the same size, but three to 4,000 pounds each. It, didn't, it wasn't conceivable to move them uh, anywhere from where they were. And uh, again, we closed the gallery that they were in and we opened up our second front of conservation in action. Uh, again, showing you the title wall and the graphic treatment and the whiteboard down there at the bottom. Um, that space had no climate control. We, we added limited uh, climate control, uh, Liber, to just for cooling. It would have been impossible to work in that space in the summertime, but uh, we also added uh, the Niederman trunks for fume exhaust, uh, and we upgraded power and data to that space. And we had a web presence as well with the same graphic treatment. Um, just some images of the mounts we made uh, to handle and ultimately to display uh, both the sarcophagus lids and the bases. Uh, treatment including, included uh, laser cleaning uh, grime off the surface. Um, which was a little problematic for the public. We had to put up folding screens uh, while, while the laser was in use, but that seemed to only encourage sort of interest and curiosity as you could see the glow coming out from behind the, the black screens that were in front of the window. Um, again, because we had the dedicated space, we were able to entertain um, groups, school groups, um, special groups, and this is a, um, a group we uh, entertain of visually impaired people uh, that are regularly in the museum and uh, with nitrile gloves on, they're allowed to put their hands uh, on the objects. Uh, I just wanted to show you this image. These are absolutely exquisite, exquisite objects that are really unparalleled anywhere in the world. Two husband and wife a sarcophagus of uh, um, uh, a son, uh, members of the same family, uh, uh, the son of the first couple and, and his wife. Uh, the next project is truly extreme. Um, it's not the space shuttle, uh, but it presented similar issues. Uh, this was started in 2011, actually overlapped with both the Haunt Horse and the Etruscan project. So there was, was a time we actually had three different conservation projects uh, going on in public view at the museum, which was fabulous. Uh, this is goddess uh, Juno. She uh, was a two year, quarter million dollar project uh, to move, mount, and treat this 13 foot, 13,000 pound uh, marble statue. Um, she was collected by Mary Pratt Sprague in the 1890s uh, with the assistance of Richard Norton. And she's believed to be the largest classical sculpture in North America. Uh, Miss Sprague was definitely competing with her neighbor, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner. It's not known where it was from and when it was uh, initially excavated, but it shows up in the inventories of the Ludovisi family. In the 1600s, it was purchased, uh, it was on display in the Ludovisi Gardens when it was purchased, uh, separate from its original uh, purpose and disposition, the sculpture had been on display at least for the last 400 years. 
and it showed it. Uh, when we first saw it, it was in absolutely deplorable condition. Uh, it was covered with biological growth. It had been tagged with graffiti. Head was fallen off. Um, it had some extremely crude previous repairs, and it had this crack, which you can see, that ran all around its midsection. Uh, some very nice patron purchased it for the museum, and I was given the direction to get it there. <laughs> it wasn't that far away. It was in Brookline, Mass. Um, we did quite a bit of work to try and figure out what it was we were dealing with. We did basic metal detection. We did ground penetrating radar. We did X radiography. Uh, probably radiated some small woodland creatures in the process. Um, and really, they all proved uh, fairly unsuccessful because the marble was so dense we really couldn't read anything on the inside. We were trying to figure out previous repairs, pins. Was she pinned to the ground? Was she pinned together at the midsection? It's pretty obvious her head was pinned on. But, uh, but one thing that did yield results was some stone samples where uh, stylistically her head didn't look right, but we kind of proved that the he her head was made from different stone. Um, and so we didn't feel too bad about the fact that I thought we needed to remove it in order for it to be safely transported. Um, this is the team trying to figure out what it was, how it was we were going to do what we were supposed to do. Um, typical for a project like this, there's three structural engineers there, the riggers there, conservation engineer, objects conservator, a metal fabricator, a stonemason, a stone cutter. Uh, we had numerous meetings to try and figure out what we were going to do. Um, the biggest problem was is that I thought she was cracked in half and there was no way we could transport her as she was and that we were going to need to pin her on site uh, prior to moving her. Um, the initial thought was that we would try and lay her down as she was as gently as we could. Uh, and then drill up through the bottom of her and uh, uh, pin her sections together. But it was actually the stonemason who came up with the idea of taking her head off first and coring down from her neck through the crack and pinning her from the top. Um, the structural engineers also suggested uh, a system called post-tensioning um, where the, the pin was set into the bottom half uh, of the sculpture and then a plate was put on her neck and uh, the rod that we pinned her with was, uh, was tightened and uh, in this way we're able to get away with holding uh, you know two six to seven thousand pound pieces of stone together with just a three quarter inch rod of stainless steel. So we, we, we had to re remove very little of the original uh, material which was great. Uh, we also had designed a, a steel carriage, if you would, uh, that we were going to move her in, try and completely immobilize her in. As beginning of the work, uh, just building up the staging around her, covering her up. It was Christmas time. I don't know if that image shows the wreath the guys put on the door of our little enclosure. Um, there's a four foot diamond saw that we took her head off with. Um, you can see the blade. This was through an old repair. Again, her head was not even original, and it was also uh, very poorly put together. And uh, we just cut her through, uh, uh, through the repair that was already there. Um, and this is what we found after we took her head off. You can see the iron pin in the center and numerous campaigns of people trying to get her head to stick to her body, which none of which looked like they were terribly successful. Uh, again, there's the drawing of her, her pin post tension, the plate that went on, um, and uh, there's a three quarter inch stainless rod, uh, and which after being tensioned was then grouted in place and the, the plate was removed. Uh, here's her steel carriage. Uh, it, it was fabricated being three sided and then once we dropped it on, uh, we put a front door on. Uh, we didn't know if she was pinned to the base she was on, so uh, uh, we dragged a, a, 
a diamond bladed uh, chain underneath her to uh, make sure she was cut uh, from her base. This went underneath her. Um, and then we dropped uh, bags full of lightweight concrete uh, in between her and the um, and her steel carriage uh, in order to in order to totally uh, form fitter to um, for transport um, uh, and totally immobilize her. She is being picked up and put on a truck and brought to the museum. Um, this was the uh, first time the press uh, really played a role uh, in in the program. Um, she, the only way she could get into the museum was to be uh, dropped through this light box, this light shaft in the roof, um, which you can see in, in both images and uh, uh, TV cameras and print press showed up and it was a big to do. Um, people outside, people inside watching. Here she is coming through the light well. <laughs> um, with the steel on, she weighed 16,000 pounds, eight tons. And the concrete slab on the second floor is only four inches thick. Um, as a result, the engineers had us build what I called the Incan Highway. <laughs> these, are, these were, I think, eight by eight timbers that had to span every piece of structural steel that was in the floor so that the concrete was never supporting the weight of the sculpture. And here's a picture. This is just the hallway coming in from where she came through the light well. Uh, she was also moved in a very primitive way on the wood rollers, Be, again, because we, uh, we couldn't point load any of that weight, so this was a way to evenly distribute uh, the eight tons uh, across the full uh, width, of, width of the hallway. We had to, had to widen the opening of the gallery door to get her into the space she was going into. Once in the space, we had to erect uh, these two staging towers uh, to fly the beams to actually stand her up. The, well, I was going to say the public part of the project really started with, with her coming through the, the ceiling, um, but, but here she is um, uh, after we've, we've opened, opened the gallery back up uh, with her installed. And we hadn't really determined what we were doing to, <laughs> past this, past this point. Um, so to begin with, we put her head, we just exhibited her head on the pedestal uh, next to her body, and you can see that three-quarter inch stainless rod coming up through her neck. You can also uh, quite easily make out that crack that runs uh, through her midsection. Uh, she was definitely designed for uh, uh, an architectural uh, installation. She was in a niche somewhere. Um, her back is very well preserved as compared to her front, uh, her front side. Uh, she also had been, um, previous restoration, she, she had definitely done a, you know, a face plant at some point in time and lost her, her nose and her lips, but, but somebody had made plugs you know, had, 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 had done restoration before and had shaved, further shaved down her face uh, in order to receive um, the sculpted nose and lips. Um, so we decided, and again, we hadn't figured this out before we got her in the museum, that we were actually going to do the same thing. That's not something we would normally do, but she was so disfigured by the fact that she had been shaved down that we thought that we would try and replace her nose and lips. Uh, so what we did was we had a, a latex mold made uh, of her head. We had a couple of plaster casts made and uh, we were able to experiment with the plaster casts we made. Um, we also had, uh, the reason we thought we could do this was because we had some other good examples of similar statues. This one's in the Louvre uh, of which to model uh, her, her features from. So here's one of the plaster casts uh, as we were trying to figure out 
uh, consultations with quite a few people, certainly with curatorial, about um, what we wanted her nose and her lips to look like. Uh, <clears throat> there's just the white the whiteboard in the gallery describing that, and, and there is uh, the plaster head after uh, those those clay clay sculpting was cast and uh, in painted, and just showing what we thought we were going to do. Um, just showing what the gallery looked like as this was ongoing. We, we put the mold on view as well for the public. Um, we built this, just, we didn't need to sec to, you know, room it off because we weren't using any, any solvents. We just put this little plexi corral uh, around the sculpture to keep the public away. And just an image to show the school kids going through the space. Um, so after we got the, modeled the features that we were happy with on the plaster head and we actually put her plaster head on to make sure we were happy with it. We, we couldn't do this with a, her real head because her real head is that big and weighs 400 pounds and we weren't going to keep picking her head up, up and down uh, trying to figure that out. So we modeled the features on the plaster head and when we got what we wanted, we put her real head back on and we put those cast plaster features on a real head. And here's description of the final stages of the project. And here she is, all done in the galleries. Um, again, this was the first, uh, our first experience with the role the press could play uh, as part of the projects uh, that we were doing in public. And uh, we made the front page of the Globe a number of times. But also, uh, again, as I mentioned, the public projects proved very popular with the funders when the, the, the piece was purchased for the museum and uh, I was told to get her there. It really had no idea what the ultimate expense of moving her to the museum would be and, and going through the process. Uh, which I just described to you. It turned out to be $250,000 and took two years. And uh, we didn't have any of that money in hand when we started. And we raised all of that money by bringing people, one group after another, into the gallery while the project was ongoing uh, and asking for help. Um, this is back to our, our first space, the permanent space. These are uh, the next few projects uh, that we did after Juno, um, just to show you some of the variety and how we were trying to mix it up in the space. Uh, this is a Japanese uh, 19th century canvas called Eight Beauties. It's actually eight prostitutes uh, hanging off the railing of their brothel. It's a little untraditional for a Japanese painting in that it's uh, the silk's been mounted to canvas and they were working on it upright. Uh, this is a uh, more traditional uh, Japanese setup where uh, they put tatami uh, reed mats on the floor and they're just making undercores for some Japanese screens, but uh, just shows you the transformation uh, of that same space. Uh, this is a door from uh, the pulpit of a mosque, uh, 14th century uh, Mamluk. And uh, again, just trying to rotate the different disciplines through the space. Uh, a lot of these were shorter term. The first number of projects I showed you were a year to two years. These, these were more in months. Um, but then this one was great because uh, on the right, uh, you can see we made uh, this special mount, which allowed uh, the, the minbar was hinged, it could be laid down to be worked on, it could be stood up for the public to view. So again, the, the sort of the project is designed, the equipment, the layout, everything uh, to be viewed by the public. Uh, this was probably the highest profile project uh, that we'd done to date. This is uh, Monet's Le Japonaise. Uh, this was about a year-long project to try and prepare this for travel. It, uh, nothing that we had ever allowed to travel before. Um, he actually uh, mixed wax with his pigments when he did this painting, and uh, the surface was incredibly unstable. Uh, and we tried to uh, remove as much of the wax as possible. Again, we had uh, 
a single funder pay for this and was um, very interested because the project was going on in public. Um, this was the first time that we actually, uh, with the whiteboard, made a point of, of pointing out the curatorial uh, conservation collaboration that was going on during the project. So this was identified on the whiteboard. Uh, ongoing, um, Irene Conifal is the paintings conservator on the left, uh, here in the left slide, and Emily Beanie, uh, the curator on the right, discussing the treatment. Wow, how many people heard of this or saw this in the press? <laughs> This was insane. Um, we were uh, contacted by an engineering firm that had been contracted by the Massachusetts State House because uh, they had uh, evidence of water damage in the basement. And they had information that led them to believe that there was a time capsule, a cornerstone, a place in the cornerstone of the Massachusetts State House. And uh, Simpson Gumbert's uh, Hager, the engineering firm, was casting about for a consultant uh, to help them remove it if, in fact, it was there. And open up the box, make sure the objects were OK, treat them if they weren't, and help them design a new box to put back. Um, I thought. It sounded like a politic thing to do, that we would ingratiate ourselves to the state. And uh, Simpson Gumpert was someone we had worked with on a number of other projects. And I thought they were great and wanted, thought it would be interesting to act as a consultant to them rather than vice versa. Um, we're never the contractee. We're always the contractor. So uh, my colleague Pam Hatchfield, the head of objects conservation, um, the plan was, first of all, they had done some ground penetrating radar, and sure enough, it looked like they located the box in the cornerstone of the state house. Uh, they knew approximately the size it was and where it was, and a plan was made that they would pick the stone up, and um, we didn't want to flip it over because we were afraid of what would happen to the contents of the box, so they were going to jack up this. I don't know, 600 pound stone, and Pam was going to crawl underneath it and chisel out the box. So on a rainy December day, uh, they scheduled that. Uh, you can't do anything at the State House without the public taking notice. Um, first the crowd gathered, then the print press showed up, then the TV cameras showed up. Um, by the end of the day, it was on live television, and um, and it only got more strange uh, after that. Um, the box had been put there by Paul Revere and Sam Adams in 1795. Uh, they say on the 20th anniversary of the Republic, although that would be 76, but that, that's, <laughs> that's what they said. Um, this was crazy. <laughs> and I mean, the whole idea of the project for me of, of bringing conservation out into the public from the start was to promote, promote the field, to raise awareness and to promote the field, always thinking that a little bit of press was good and more press was better. But this was out of control. This was completely out of control. And the interesting part, which we were actually talking about at dinner last night, was it changed, it created, it made the, the, the project and the treatment of the box dynamic in which we had to respond to the response that we were getting, which to me is an unforeseen consequence of moving out into the public realm. We actually supplied conservation images to the press for the for press release, we got an X radiograph into the Boston Globe. We were looking at the, the contents of the box um, prior to opening it. But the opening uh, of the box was just supposed to take, you know, that's just something we were going to do up in the lab. Um, 
that that wasn't going to fly. Um, uh, in the end, this was something that was uh, incredibly choreographed. This is uh, the press department's floor plan uh, for the event in which the box would be opened. You can see we have our table in front uh, with the microscope, uh, 40 selected guests, um, and uh, every national press affiliate. Uh, was there. The largest press event the museum ever did. And it was a conservation project. <laughs> um, there was a live feed to CNN. There was a simulcast to the entire Mass State Legislature. Um, and look, it took place in front of the Sully. There it is, <laughs> in the American galleries. Uh, there's the Director Malcolm, the Secretary of State, William Galvin, uh, the Governor, Deval Patrick. Everyone was there. And here are the contents. I thought I'd show you the contents. There's the box on the left. There's a small plaque engraved by Paul Revere. Here is a number of coins that were uh, placed in there as well as uh, newspapers of the day uh, and the such. Um, moving on from that, this is where we're at today in conservation of act in action. There are uh, two projects that are going on in there simultaneously. There's a 15th century Byzantine uh, tempera on panel altarpiece that's on the left and uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin West's uh, St. Stephen altarpiece, which is a 22 foot high painting that was done for uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral in London designed by uh, Christopher Wren. Uh, this is coming up next year. Uh, this is yet another space we're going to colonize in the museum. Um, the Death of the Historical Buddha. This is an absolutely enormous, I think it's 20 feet, uh, unrolled. Uh, obviously too large to take place in, in the Asian Conservation Studio. Um, it's going to fe feature a collaboration with the conservation staff from the Freer Sackler. Um, which will make a point of uh, advertising in, in the graphics. Um, and an overhead camera because uh, for the first time because the treatment will take place on the floor. It'll be a lot harder to view uh, for the public. So we'll have a monitor there. Uh, the camera will be filming. Um, uh, not only will they be able to get an overhead view of the work that's going on, but uh, we'll edit it and we'll run the video when there isn't work taking place in the gallery. So. Uh, people will know what's going on. That's the history of the program at the museum. Um, I'm not quite sure what I conclude <laughs> uh, after running through it with you. I, now that I got what I wanted as far as getting conservation out uh, into the public realm. Um, I certainly need to figure out how to better make it work for me. Um, we've certainly proved that the public likes it and wants it, and it's a way to get attention from the press, um, but certainly need to figure out how to channel that interest and enthusiasm into long-term support. Um, We'll also have to carry uh, the story of the treatment of the objects um, into the galleries permanently, not just have the conservation treatments themselves take place in the galleries, but have the information about the treatments and the history of the treatments as part of the permanent displays. Uh, we've been successful with that for the mosaic uh, where the video continues to run in the gallery. Uh, we have that with uh, Juno, uh, where there's permanent uh, graphics as part of the display about uh, her treatment and uh, moving her into the museum. 
We have that as part of the display of uh, the one Etruscan sarcophagus that we put out uh, talking about the conservation treatment. Um, yeah, we titled the talk, you know, conservation is performance. It's not, in the end, it's not about performance. That's really just the hook. Um, it's about education. It's about the discourse that's possible when the disciplines are integrated. Um, I wanted to leave you with photos of uh, the whiteboards. I took these just two days ago. This is in front of the, um, the two projects, uh, the Benjamin West and the Byzantine altarpiece. I'll just let you read them. The first one, you know, really is just about the science of conservation. You can let me know when you get through it. Science, it's science. And this one's um, about the altarpiece. And I'll leave you with that, as well as contribute to scholarly research. Thank you.